Good morning, everyone. My name is Christina, and we are pleased to welcome you to the Washington Labs Academy webinar series. We hope you find the next hour or so useful and informative. We've developed our webinar series to deal with some of the technical and administrative issues our customers face on a day-to-day -day basis. We recognize that engineering challenges can be complex, and we're always looking for ways to support the technology industry. Before we begin, I'm going to go over just a few housekeeping details. First of all, I hope everyone is able to see the title slide on their computer. This presentation is part of our webinar series presented this calendar year. We've muted everyone's microphone to keep the meeting quality as high as possible. A recording of the presentation is underway and will be sent to all attendees, and a training certificate is sent to attendees of the live presentation. A full screen view may be preferred. In the menu on your screen, you go to View and then select Full Screen. Use the Escape key to return to a normal view. We do encourage questions during the presentation. You can submit a question by enabling the chat icon at the top or side of your screen and typing your question to the host. You will go through questions at the end of the presentation as time permits. We'd love to hear from you. You can contact us via phone or email. Please reach out to academy at WLL.com or to the presenter directly. And now I'd like to introduce our speaker. Mark Maynard is the Business Development and Communication Manager at ACB Incorporated with a shared goal supporting Washington Laboratories in the business and training arena. He has over 35 years of telecom, information technology, and compliance engineering experience. He also serves as the president of the IEEE Product Safety Engineering Society, is an INRD certified product safety engineer, and an IEEE senior member. Mark lives in Austin, in the Austin, Texas area with his wife Lisa and is a graduate of Texas State University. So without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and hand the presentation over to you, Mark. Well, good morning, everybody. I'm glad everybody could join us today. I'm going to be talking uh, today about some uh, wireless approvals around the world and, and also uh, be incorporating a uh, business look at uh, figuring out what market countries you should be in. Uh, on my uh, title slide here, this projection is this one I've discovered recently. It's not a new projection. I've discovered it's been out there for a while, but it's called the uh, Pierce projection, and it's uh, more closely um, represents the actual uh, land mass sizes of the world as opposed to the Mercator uh, projection we're used to seeing, which distorts uh, things in the southern, uh, you know, the, the close to the North Pole and South Pole. The only distortions in this one are at the center of each side, which is, happens to be ocean, so you don't really see the distortion there. But as you can see, uh, Africa is much, much larger than North America, and if you look at a Mercator, they look about the same size. So. Um, that was just something I wanted to point out that is going to weigh into what we're talking about a little bit today. So uh, my uh, view for this one is, of, uh, you know, there's all kinds of presentations on, you know, uh, FCC and Industry Canada, and the, uh, which is now ISCD, um, and then the uh, EU requirements, the, uh, you know, China, India, Japan, South Korea, Australia, and Taiwan, and the Asia Pacific or large market countries, and these are a lot of the countries that uh, uh, companies will start out going to if they're phasing their, uh, you know, starting uh, with the largest markets, uh, you know, uh, for their products first and then spreading out from there. So that's what I'm going to look at, some ways you can figure out what market countries would make sense for your companies and your products. Uh, in the Asia uh, uh, engine today, we're going through uh, uh, six countries in the Asia Pacific that would be uh, good after uh, those we talked about. And uh, the top three in South America, the top four in Africa, six countries in the Middle East region, and then uh, looking at non EU Europe and some advice on uh, how you can tell the different types of countries there and the requirements and what they'll accept for proof of compliance. I do want to mention. Um, all the maps and the demographic information that I'm uh, displaying in my presentation today are courtesy of the USA uh, uh, CIA World Factbook Online. Uh, this, uh, they allow free use as long as I give them credit, and so that's what I'm doing right here, giving them credit and providing that link. It can provide a lot of useful information on the economic uh, output of the country, the you know the markets, uh, what they import, export, uh, the population, how. 
uh, widespread technology is implemented through things like internet and uh, phone systems and mobile phones. And uh, just a lot of general information on uh, the political situations, if there's unrest in a country and things like that. So these are your tax dollars at work. So I uh, uh, recommend you make use of this when you're looking at potential markets you're going to be taking your products to. So uh, we're going to start off with the Asia Pacific. And you see my little gray box down there. That's my uh, caveat that you have. I assume you're already shipping to these uh, large market countries, uh, which are uh, a lot of times uh, first tier or second tier of a product launch. Uh, a lot of times the company will start with the North American and uh, European Union markets, and then uh, once they start getting income from there, we'll uh, use that to facilitate going out to the rest of the countries and getting additional approvals. Um, the, uh, one of the things I, I, I get from the, that World Fact book is the gross domestic product per person parity. And uh, what this is, is uh, it's, it's uh, uh, a way of looking at GDP that's averaged over the total population. So you can look at it for, for instance, uh, the population rack for India, Indonesia, it's the fifth largest uh, country in the world population-wise. It's a, a nation of islands uh, uh, spread over South Pacific, South of Malaysia, and Northwest of Australia. And uh, you see the population ranks fifth, the GDP PPP is ninth in the world, so that tells you the uh, GDP per person is a little bit lower than, uh, uh, but that's still still very high ranking. There's uh, uh, the uh, World Fact book lists about 240 countries approximately. And uh, so there's still a decent market. You see the mobile cellular uh, usage proportionally is uh, a little bit higher than the population would indicate. Internet usage a little less. You can see where there'd be issues with getting an internet in the country that's spread over uh, hundreds and thousands of islands all over, scattered over this region of the Pacific Ocean. So their telecom wireless authority is the Director General of Resources and Equipment of Post and in Information in their native language, that's the SDPPI acronym. And so it's the Ministry of Communications Information Technology is the parent organization that SDPPI is under. And this previously was the DGPT uh, agency uh, back in, in change in 2011. They do have an English language website. Uh, you go to this website and then there will be a button you can push uh, virtually with your mouse to switch to English. Their frequency man management is uh, managed by the Director General of SDPPI, uh, so it's a unit within there, the Frequency Spectrum Monitoring Unit. Anything from 3 kilohertz to 3 terahertz is regulated, and uh, they're looking at information communication technology products within this range. So as you're um, seeing a lot of more consolidation of uh, ITE products and communication technology products, so things like um, as uh, you know, smartphones get smarter, and the, uh, so they're more like ITE equipment, and ITE is uh, getting more communication, so there's a lot of crossover. So a lot of agencies are incorporating both. And uh, you can download copy, PDF copies of the MCIT ordinances um, at this link I've provided here in English. So that's a good source for getting the actual requirements, and there's no charge from the website. And uh, for they do have a labeling requirement. Uh, so it's going to be legible on the product. It can be black and white, and I recommend that because if it's not black and white and you're trying to match the uh, colors, they've got uh, uh, a specific color palette you have to follow. It has to be permanent. You know, it's the typical of labeling requirements. They say permanent. This just means very difficult to remove, um, where you'd have to like scar or, or, or something to get it off. And so the uh, the way the labeling goes um, is uh, with the uh, certification number and a slash, and then SDPPI for the agency name, and then the uh, 20 YY is just the year it was certification is granted. It's exactly like it was under DGPT. Instead of DGPT in the middle, you got SDPPI. There was grandfathering back in 2011 when they switched over. These certs are only good for three years, so anything that was grandfathered should have expired by the end of 2013, uh, 2015. 2014, I'll get it right eventually. And then they are a CB scheme member country under the IECEE. And this is a conformity assessment system that's international. And there are uh, uh, countries that have signed up to join it. And if they do, they will accept the same product safety reports as long as it has the country specific deviations, if there are any for uh, that specific country, such as Indonesia. And you can get more information about the link I provided here on the CB scheme.
We also have forms available, that, uh, technical construction file forms, and other forms that you need to, to prepare those reports. Uh, Malaysia is uh, has a GDP of uh, PPP of 29th in the world, and you see the population ranks 42nd. So that means per person, they're more productive uh, than, for example, Indonesia we just looked at. Uh, mobile cellular and internet users uh, both proportionally rank above their population. So these, this is a high tech country. They've got a, a lot of information uh, technology incorporated there. Uh, when I worked at Dell, we had a, a factory there in Penang. It's on the uh, west side on a little island. You see where Georgetown is on this map here is uh, approximately there. And I had several trips there setting up their factory and training regulatory staff. Uh, they're uh, very energetic people, very diverse population. Uh, the native Malays uh, uh, and the uh, uh, Chinese immigrants and Indian immigrants all seem to get along. Uh, English is a language, common language they selected on uh, because uh, each of those uh, three populations speaks a different language. And so it can make it easy for American or English speaking countries to set up there. So there are three different agencies, uh, and I've got them listed here. We're going to go through them. Uh, but CIRM is the main one for the Wireless Telecom Authority, and then others associated with getting the standards and the requirements. Um, so CIRM, they have a website, English language, as all these uh, websites are in Malaysia. And so uh, they're also promoting technology within the country. And you have to uh, purchase the labels directly, although this is changing. Their, uh, they're phasing over to where you can uh, print on the uh, demand type labels. You can print your own. Uh, similar to the China system where you have to have approval to print your labels. And so uh, be looking for information on that. And they have to be placed in a factory. Uh, this can't be you know, a warehouse that's shipped to in Malaysia. It has to be a registered factory with the serum agency. Malaysian uh, Communication Multimedia Commission. So they're managing frequency spectrum, allocating frequency for different uh, reasons, working with the international bodies on frequency spectrum. And so uh, you can get the website there, and they have a lot of information available on that, what's allowed in different sections. So if you've got uh, different devices like short range devices or other that are uh, uh, can vary around the world, it's uh, good to go there and find out. Two other agencies, Department of Standards. So they publish the official standards. This is where you can pur purchase official Malaysian standards from. And then the uh, uh, MTSFB is, uh, is going to be the one that's developing those standards that the Department of Standards publishes. And uh, they, they're they getting input from CIRM and the DSM, the, the Department of Standards uh, Malaysia. So you can go to their website and get more information on the standards development in Malaysia. They're also a CB scheme member country, accepting those uh, common reports as long as they have Malaysia specific deviations. And you can get more information on the same website. Vietnam is becoming a real popular site for manufacturers. Uh, so it's a GDP, PPP is 37th in the world, but I've also uh, included this uh, GDP RGR, that's real growth rate. And this indicates a high growth rate. Of, uh, at 18th in the world, meaning the 18th uh, fastest growing uh, GDP out of all 240 something countries. Uh, population 15th, but you see mobile sellers 10th. A lot of uh, cell uh, cell phones are the uh, telecommunications backbone there uh, in practice, and the internet users are pretty high uh, in proportion to the population. So uh, they're definitely in the uh, high tech uh, arena. They have the Ministry of Information Communications, or MIC, and so you have to have the approval of anything that connects to TTE, uh, telecommunications, uh, telephone equipment, anything uh, hardwired connects to the uh, telephone infrastructure, and any information technology equipment that utilizes RF or a spectrum, and virtually everything's got wireless in it now, so virtually everything's going to have to have some type of approval. They do have an English language website with a lot of information available for it. You can download the uh, standards uh, from the website here, and I've, I've given you a link here. And these standards cover uh, different criteria, not just wireless and telecom, but also cover some EMC and EMI and SAR, that specific absorption rate uh, for things like cell phones, how much energy they're uh, outputting into the human body. And there's product safety uh, criteria included in that also. They do have a uh, labeling requirement. It's optional, so I don't know of anybody that's ever uh, used this, but I'm sure some uh, have some place. But uh, uh, if you decide to do that, there, there is an actual artwork you can get from their website. 
They're also a CB scheme member country, accepting those same CB scheme reports with country specific deviations. Singapore, a uh, very small country uh, population wise. You see it's 114, so they're about uh, you know the middle of the group of 240 countries. But their GDP PPP is 41st in the world. You know, uh, vastly. Uh, uh, out of proportion to their population rank. A lot of banking industry, finance, and so they generate a lot of wealth in this country. And it's just on the uh, south side of Malaysia. That little map there, you see a square there. That's the enlarged area that's shown in the uh, left side of your screen there. I uh, see mobile cell phone and internet users, 92nd and 73rd, and that uh, kind of looks slow until you realize they're population 114, so that means proportionally uh, they've got more uh, cell technology and internet uh, uh, providers and stuff in their country. Exports and imports, 14th in the world and 16th in the world, so you see that's also way out of proportion. So they're, they're just a uh, economic uh, powerhouse there and they'll attract a market for a lot of high-tech companies. They're, they had an agency change too over the past few years. It's now the Infocom Media Development Authority. It used to be IDA for Information Development Authority. And they've got specific acts and regulations you can uh, download from the link provided there. They have compliance standards you can download uh, where I've got IMDA compliance standards for TTE and wireless. And then you can go and get specific ones you need for hardwired line terminal equipment standards or the wireless radio communication equipment standards. And they have a frequency chart available where you can see what's been assigned for what specific purposes. So if you've got, you know, uh, some kind of location device or uh, aircraft or some specific frequency bands you're looking at that may not be common around the world, you can go get an idea there uh, of what's going to be allowed. They do have labeling requirement, and just uh, like under the previous IDA uh, a scheme, it complies with IMDA standard, TSSORD, and uh, their standards are, uh, instead of numbers, they've got SRD for short range device and similar uh, wording for other types of standards, and TS for technical standard. If its device is too small to have it on the uh, label, then it can be in the user guide, so they don't require it to be on the uh, product label. Also, CB scheme member country. Once again, they'll accept those CB scheme product safety reports with the country specific deviations. Philippines, population rank 13th in the world, uh, and their uh, cell phone use proportional to that. Internet use is a little less, but once again, you've got an island country, so getting a, a national infrastructure is a little bit more uh, uh, involved. A very attractive market. They, uh, we're a strong ally of the United States for years. Uh, they're trying to get uh, established a little bit more independence. They have the uh, NCC, National Geo Communications Commission Agency. It's been around for a while, uh, very uh, developed infrastructure. They're a very informative English language website. We get a lot of information, the forms, middle forms, and other things. They accept FCC reports and grants as proof of compliance. And uh, it, uh, normally, uh, the agency times one week can be longer, and this is assuming you know you're submitting with everything. And it, uh, this is once it arrives at the agency at whatever your submittal method is. Uh, but there are peak times like you know uh, gets bunched up prior to the beginning of the school year with all the IT uh, products wanting to come out around Christmas time and other similar uh, times when you expect there to be a, a, a big rush of products trying to get approved. They do have a labeling requirement. It can be black and white, doesn't have to be color, and it's got to have the NTC logo. Uh, two different wordings there. Top accepted is for anything that's a radio wireless device, and uh, type approved is for anything hardwired like modems or fax machines that physically connect with a, a wire to the uh, telephone telecommunications network. Thailand's uh, been getting a lot of uh, more development recently. Uh, a lot of manufacturers are uh, starting to look at this. Uh, population rank and GDP are right in line with each other. Uh, so productive co uh, country. Cell phone is uh, proportionally higher than most countries at 16th, and the internet uses around 30th. So they've still got some ways to do on internet infrastructure. So if you're selling something like uh, server systems or uh, internet infrastructure, you know, routers, hub switches, this might be a good market for you, or any of these countries where uh, the internet usage is proportionally less than uh, their population. Uh, they have the National Broadcasting and Telecoms Commission, MBTC. 
They accept FCC reports and grants as proof of compliance. They've got a good English language website, uh, links I've provided here. And the regulatory authorities through the TIE legislation, uh, you can access that there. They have a frequency allocation spectrum utilization chart for seeing what's allowed and what spectrum. They don't require product labeling. They do have a safety agency. It's the TIE Standards uh, Industrial Standards Institute. It's only applies to uh, specific types of products, mainly like lighting, uh, lighting fixtures, uh, uh, Power uh, strips, power adapters, AC mains uh, uh, concerned uh, devices like switches and uh, uh, things of that nature. So uh, they do have an English language website. You can go see what's required and download the compulsory standards for free from there. They're also a CB scheme uh, member country, accepting those CB scheme reports. So next, I'm going to jump over to South America. So Argentina, Brazil, and China, those are the three largest market countries in South America. Uh, also, uh, if you notice, I didn't cover Central America. Proportionally, they're, they're smaller than a lot of the other countries in South America, so they'd probably be in the third or fourth tier that you might look at going into. But uh, these are definitely good market countries, high-tech countries, uh, well-developed infrastructure. And as you can see from Argentina, their uh, GDP PPP proportionally is uh, uh, high uh, based on their uh, population rank and then their uh, mobile uh, cell phone uh, usage and internet users are proportionally higher than most other countries. They have a uh, new agency, it's a, a NACOM is the acronym for it. And uh, previously was CNC, they have a website, Spanish language website, as the case with all South American uh, uh, agencies I'm discussing today. Uh, the Google Translate does a pretty good job on uh, translating uh, Spanish language documents, but keep in mind those aren't official translations. So for your submittals, you're gonna need you know official uh, translate copies uh, or have a uh, partner in uh, one of these countries that's uh, taking care of your submittals for you. So anything that's wired or wireless connects to telecom infrastructure or communications uh, technology is going to be covered. And uh, they have uh, standards uh, available free on their websites. And uh, once again, these are in Spanish, but they're called uh, normativa or uh, norms. Uh, you've probably heard from uh, Europeans refer to standards. So it's the uh, same type of thing. These are just their standards uh, uh, for the compliance requirements. Uh, you have to have a local importer in Argentina, so if you don't have a, a, a physical presence, a physical office in a country, there are uh, authorized uh, third-party agents you can hire. You have to have a, uh, a letter of authorization with them that they can act on behalf of the company. And they, uh, the agency wants this person to contact in case of product recalls or they have questions from the manufacturer and want to get directly in contact with them, mainly for you know urgent issues uh, like a safety incident or something like that. And uh, they don't accept uh, foreign test reports except FCC or CE reports for some cellular uh, GSM technology. And uh, any product testing has got to be done at the authorizing country test laboratories. They do have marking requirements. Uh, we get certs are good for three years. And as with most agencies, overall lead time is about six to eight weeks. Uh, Argentina has very well developed product safety agency, IRAM. They've been around for a long number of years and uh, they've got a, uh, this uh, resolution 92-1998 uh, tells what uh, products required to be certified and they have resolutions, uh, uh, just think of them as standards uh, that, uh, that are available that, for free to download and I give the, these are sort of like the FCC bulletins and uh, you know, official published uh, documents that they put in the uh, Federal Register for the uh, US FCC. Well, they have resolutions that their government publishes. Anything from uh, zero to uh, uh, 1,000 volts AC or 1,500 volts DC and with power consumption rate of five kilovolt amps. So uh, insulation materials up to 633 amps. But you can get more details from those resolutions. Brazil has the best, oh, most thorough uh, developed uh, compliance structure in there if you've dealt with uh, uh, 
Alaska Metro and Anatel, you know what I'm uh, talking about, but the population eighth in the world. This is one of the BRIC countries for Brazil, Russia, India, and China. Uh, it is a, a first-tier country for a lot of companies. For a lot of others, it'd be a second-tier country. So it just depends on your situation. See, their uh, population rank is in line with the cell phone and internet users rank, high tech country. Uh, GDP, PPP, a little bit less proportionally, but still, uh, you know, they've had some economic difficulties recently, but it's still an economic uh, powerhouse. Great market to be in. So their structure is based around the uh, Anatel is, um, you know, at the top of the, the uh, uh, little uh, chart there. And uh, we're going to talk about the uh, OCDs. Those are accredited uh, designated certification bodies. OCD is the acronym in Portuguese, which is the official language in Brazil. And uh, any uh, product certification testing has got to be at an in-metro uh, laboratory uh, that, that's accredited by SBAC. That's the lab accreditation body in uh, Brazil, sort of like A2LA is here. Is one of them, and so in addition to uh, so a third-party certification partner, if you're in, unless you've got a somebody who speaks Brazilian Portuguese fluently, actually had one of those persons at a company I worked at previously, but uh, otherwise these other agencies, EAN-GS1 is a barcode standards, but um, as I found out recently, those barcodes are no longer required on the product. But then there's a local representative, just like Argentina and most South American countries, you've got to have a local representative that has a letter of authorization for your company to act on behalf of your company. And then test lab is certified, and then a registered translator for user documents and uh, any official uh, uh, materials are going to be going with the system to consumers and end users. And then the manufacturer actually is designed and developed and is going to build the product. So three categories of equipment I have to do with, uh, you know, whether uh, uh, category one is the consumer items intended for your uh, general public use. Item two is uh, anything not covered by category one, that's their wording. And uh, so anything like antennas, amplifiers, transceivers, that'll be all your Wi-Fi devices, uh, Bluetooth, RFID. And category three is mainly, uh, you know, in, industrial type equipment stuff that, you know, your uh, switches have gateways used for internet infrastructure, the uh, cell towers, those kinds of things. So there's two certificates. One is from Anatel, the home legation certif uh, certificate, and it's going to be issued to the designated local representative. Another reason you need to have a local rep. And the OCD technical certificate issued by the OCD that authorized accrediting body and uh, could have expiration date and is typically issued to the manufacturer. But you have to maintain both of those. Remember, the, uh, when this says no expiration date, that means as long as there's no product changes. If you just, um, change any uh, uh, fundamental uh, design characteristic, then you've got to go back to the agency for resubmittal or reapproval of some type. So this barcode has uh, uh, been eliminated as a requirement, but you do still require the Anatel logo, the uh, certification number, and uh, the uh, model number also on there. And if you are using a barcode, it still has to meet that EAN standard, uh, GS1-128. But as I mentioned, that's no longer a requirement. In Metro, is uh, kind of similar to our NIST agency in the United States. Uh, they're the National Institute of uh, Metrology Standardization and Industrial Quality. So they're making sure the uh, certification body is accredited, test labs are accredited. And so you've got to use one of these OCPs. Uh, make sure the test lab you're using is OCP uh, accredited for product certification body. And then uh, product certification testing has got to be uh, performed by one of these uh, RBLE test laboratories accredited by Metro, and they've got an English language website uh, with a, a lot of good information on there. You notice I did mention one for in Metro, I mean, uh, Anatel, they do have an English language website. There's nothing technical on there, nothing really is going to help you with submittals. It's an official language website. It's in Portuguese. Uh, Google Translate does a somewhat good job of on that language, but once again, it's not official translation. And Metro has a uh, list of products that uh, mandatory certification, these things like medical equipment, hazardous location equipment, you know, AC uh, power uh, equipment, and there are uh, voluntary certifications. Uh, these are done sometimes for uh, sales to government agencies within Brazil or companies might, might require them. This is what their label looks like. 
Chile as uh, population ranks 64th, GDP, PPP 45th, and cell phone and uh, internet usage is in the 40s also. So proportionally, we're using a lot of this stuff, uh, more than most countries. So it's a pretty high tech country. Uh, they have Subtel as the telecom agency there, and they'll accept FTC reports and grants as proof of compliance, except for devices that connect to the TTE infrastructure. So they've got to be tested in country. So if you've got like, you know, uh, network telephone interface, things like that, they've got to uh, be tested in country. They don't require local reps or factory inspections, and product labels are not required unless it's a SAR item like a mobile phone, uh, portable mobile device. And then uh, they've got to have the uh, correct labeling so they can trace it back that the SAR testing has been done. Spanish language website with a lot of information. They do have a product safety agency, uh, but uh, as I mentioned, it applies to just uh, specific products uh, like it does in several other countries, the lighting, AC uh, product, uh, power products, uh, electric tools. So things like that. And they do have a, a list of accredited bodies that you can get from the website. And it's with, uh, uh, same with Argentina, user manuals have to be in Spanish. Africa, as I uh, pointed out at the beginning, it's a huge, uh, huge continent. And uh, I don't really realize uh, sometimes how big it is, but uh, there's 50 countries in Africa. Uh, there's uh, some regions that have some political unrest, but there's a lot of regions that are real good markets. And based on uh, GDP, PPP, these are the four uh, top ones, Algeria, Egypt, Nigeria, and South Africa. Algeria has an agency website that's in French and Arabic, and Google Translate does a pretty good job on the French portion. Uh, population, mobile phones, and GDP, PPP are all in line with each other. Internet usage is a little bit less. And uh, uh, they uh, do require local reps. They require uh, test samples, uh, even if they're uh, uh, taking those grants from FCC or EU. And uh, also, uh, with that local rep, you've got to have letter of authorization. And uh, uh, pretty good. Uh, I would recommend getting an agent uh, in Africa that's experienced with this, as with all uh, African countries and South American countries because the infrastructure can be a, a little bit hard to navigate. Egypt's got a very well-developed uh, regulatory system, uh, the National Telecom Telecommunications Regulatory Authority. So a population rank 16th in the world is in line with mobile phone internet usage. GDP PPP is uh, down uh, from what you would expect, but they've had some issues uh, internally over the last several years. But uh, they, they're still a uh, pretty good ranking, 23rd in the world. So a good market. Um, I only require in-country testing for telecom products like Algeria. They'll accept EU uh, CE reports uh, for proof of compliance. And the uh, also, uh, you know, over the past few years, there have been some political unrest there. So during those times, uh, you know, the uh, this stop agency doesn't probably get the uh, resources it needs all times and uh, things get backlogged. So just keep that in mind as you're submitting your products. Nigeria has two different agencies you can need to deal with. The telecom agency is Nigerian Communications Commission. And at uh, recent conference, I got to met, meet one of the uh, uh, engineers that works for NCC. And they also have the Standards Agency of Nigeria Conformity Assessment Program. Uh, so this is one that's overseeing the standards and making sure that everything's in line. Uh, so you have to obtain both these certifications uh, that go through there. And as long as you've got a, a good agent, uh, you should be okay. And you notice the population rank eighth in the world, very large country population-wide, mobile phone and internet use ninth in the world. So they're uh, definitely uh, adopters of high-tech infrastructure. Uh, they've uh, Proportionally, got a lower uh, GDP, BBP, but they are uh, do have a growing economy as a lot of the countries in Africa are. And I think they're good markets to be in over the next 10, 20 years. Are going to they develop more economically and politically, and uh, are able to uh, uh, start getting uh, more infrastructure in there and uh, uh, more industry. I think there's going to be a uh, very attractive growth markets there. South Africa has probably got the most, uh, most well-developed, longest uh, existing compliance programs. ICASA is a telecom authority, and they have a very good English language website. 
uh, a lot of adoption of high tech equipment, and uh, they accept FCC or EU reports and grants. They do require that you set up an account before you submit it, so make sure you have all those things in place and with the local rep also. They also have EMC and product safety requirements there that uh, the other African countries I mentioned don't. So uh, they've uh, got SOBs, and there's been more, uh, I think, cross pollination between ICASA and SOBs recently, more uh, interact agency cooperation. So uh, uh, they have the same requirement for local rep. Uh, they do require test samples in some cases, and they'll accept those EU reports and CB scheme reports. In Middle East, there's a lot of you know petrodollars still out there, uh, a lot of wealth in, uh, from other, other industries in some regions, and we're going to talk about these. These are the six largest uh, based on the GDP PPP in the Middle East. Saudi Arabia, you, know, you can see a real outsized GDP PPP here, a population rank 47, but they're uh, 15th in the world uh, based on that GDP. Mobile phone use at 29th, internet user at 35th, so proportionally pretty high uh, adopters of uh, high tech devices. They do have a telecom authority, CITC, the Communications Information Technology Commission, English language website. So anything wired or uh, wireless that connects to the communications or telecom infrastructure has to be approved. They don't require local reps. They can, uh, you know, they reserve the right to request uh, samples, don't always do that. And they'll accept either FCC or EU reports and uh, FCC grants of proof of compliance. They do have a uh, product safety organization, SASO, Saudi Standards, Metrology, and Quality Organization, English language website, a lot of good information. They don't require local reps. They don't require test samples, but they'll accept the uh, IC standards or CB uh, test reports as proof of compliance. United Arab Emirates, often referred to as just UAE. See population ranked on 112th in the world, and from the map here, very small country land size-wise, but very wealthy, you know, with the GDP PPP, 33rd in the world. High uh, usage of cell phones, internet users, so attractive market country for a lot of high-tech companies. We have TRA, Telecommunications Regulatory Authority. A lot of these agencies will have similar names, as we'll see in a minute here, but uh, make sure you're looking at the, uh, if you're just Googling TRA, you might come up with different countries. Make sure you're uh, looking at the right country. And you can tell there's a, a list of internet country codes you get. AE is for United Arab Emirates. Uh, and so uh, you can uh, look them up and uh, uh, see what if the country is, uh, domain name is actually the country you're looking at. So uh, they require a local rep. And they do require in-country testing uh, for certain devices, uh, for some reason, on tablet computers and cellular GSM devices. It will accept the UCE reports as proof of compliance. Iraq, the population GDP is uh, in line with each other. Phone use is in line, but you can see they've got a ways to go in their internet infrastructure. So it would be an attractive market for a lot of companies as that country is rebuilding from the ongoing years of conflict. I do want to mention, uh, there's one aspect you're going to have to be looking at worldwide, and here's a resource for you to look at if you're a U.S.-based company. Uh, U.S., uh, you know, sometimes in totally embargoes countries, there's five countries in the world uh, where U.S. companies are not allowed to engage in any commerce except for approved cases of humanitarian aid, and these are uh, Cuba, uh, North Korea, Sudan, Syria, and uh, so if, unless you're uh, authorized by the Department of Commerce, Department of Treasury to give you humanitarian aid, you can't have any dealings there. Iraq is what they call targeted parties. That means the country is not embargoed, but certain groups or certain individuals within that country are. And so you have to go and look and make sure you're not selling products to somewhere you shouldn't be. For instance, in Iraq, I'm pretty sure that ISIS is on that list of groups that you should not be selling products to. But you can go to this link here and uh, get all the uh, countries and all the specific programs in place that, uh, with those targeted parties for all the different countries and what you might be going to. Today's presentation, this is the only country that is covered with this, but there are other countries in the Middle East and uh, uh, 
Africa and, and some other places that uh, you got to make sure that you're selling to the right people. So they have the Communication Media Commission. We've got English language website. A lot of good uh, information there. They accept the EU uh, Radio Equipment Directive reports as proof of compliance. Uh, Qatar is in uh, a very small country land size wise, but you see population rank 144, but GDP BPV is 50 cents in the world. And their mobile cell phone and internet users appear small, but compared to population, that's uh, proportionally larger than most countries in the world. They have a communications regulatory authority with the English language website, a lot of good information there. Don't require local reps, don't require test samples. They'll just accept those EU uh, CE reports as uh, uh, proof of compliance, the radio equipment directive reports. Kuwait, very wealthy country, very small in size. Uh, population rank 141st, GDP PPP is 55th proportionally larger uh, cell phone and internet users to the rest of the world. And the Ministry of Communications, we also have a safety agency. Um, the public authority for industry is, is with a lot of these agencies we've been looking at, they're only concerned about specific products such as lighting, uh, lighting fixtures, uh, AC power devices, and things along those natures. They don't require local reps or test samples, and they'll accept the EU uh, test reports as proof of compliance. Israel has a very high tech industry there, uh, a lot of software development, um, uh, a lot of military electronics are developed there. So you see the population ranked 99th in the world, but the GDP PPP 57th in the world. So uh, once again, a, a very wealthy nation and proportionally higher uh, rates of mobile phone and internet users than the rest of the world. They have a very well-developed infrastructure for EMC and safety, the Standards Institute of uh, Israel, very good English language web a website, and uh, you require local reps in country, in country testing samples are required, and uh, they uh, require those to be tested to the SII standards. Their wireless agency, a telecom agency, the Ministry of Communications, uh, they have a very good English language website there, and uh, it's going to require uh, uh, wireless that transmits and receives can require two certs, one for the transmitter portion, one for the receiver portion. But that's just uh, 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 part of the process. You just have to let them know up front that this is not solely a receiver, not solely a, 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 a transmitter, it's a transceiver. And they'll accept, uh, accept the uh, uh, EU RED reports as, as proof of compliance. And the last group I'm going to go over today is the non EU Europe. So there's uh, one block called the Eurasian Economic Union, and I'll talk about the uh, three uh, other types that are we find in other non-European Union uh, countries that are in Europe. So the EU or CU, you may have seen these acronyms, the Eurasian Economic Union or Customs Union, uh, that's, they have a flag, and I've shown it uh, uh, just right above that title there. Uh, these are, it's an economic union modeled on the uh, European Union. And uh, the uh, Russia wanted to have an economic bloc that would uh, compete with the European Union. Uh, how well they're doing that, I'll leave it up to your judgment. But uh, they've currently got five countries in there. Uh, two of them are probably decent market countries. But the point is that with this one approval, for the EU uh, that you can uh, ship to all five countries. It doesn't, uh, they're phasing it in for all criteria, currently only covers EMC and product safety. So uh, it's only been in existence for seven years and uh, start with Belarus, Kazakhstan, and Russia. And uh, Armenia and Kurdistan join later, but they're uh, pretty small countries. They're mainly looking at potential countries to join that are former Soviet countries, Soviet Union countries. But it is a large market size, uh, about 200 million uh, in these five countries, three trillion gross domestic product, and it's about 15% of the Earth's land mass. And they've got an English language website with a lot of information on the structure and the, the organization. Now, the, their standards they follow are called Technical Regulations Customs Union, so it's TRCU, you'll see that acronym some. So these standards are uh, applied uh, or accepted by all five of these countries that are part of the EU, and uh, they currently have over 50, so they've got EMC and product safety, they don't have wireless telecom in place yet. 
And so uh, for it, we'll look at Russia's infrastructure to kind of get an idea of it. So you know, Russia, a very attractive market country, one of the BRIC countries. It may be one of your first tier countries. A lot of countries, will be uh, companies will be second or third tier. But uh, a lot of oil uh, reserves still. Um, uh, world's leading oil producer, uh, eighth largest oil reserve, second largest natural gas producer. And then the GDP, PPP, seventh largest in the world. And uh, mobile and internet use is uh, in line with that. Population ranked 10, so proportionally, uh, you know, they're doing better in those categories than most countries in the world. So certification structure on the left side, we see that EEU TRCU certification takes care of the EMC and product safety aspect. But since they haven't implemented the wireless uh, uh, scheme yet, so they've still got the individual countries in there. In Russia, there's a hygienic and a, a, a wireless telecom uh, uh, side to it. And so we'll talk a little bit about those. So they have an EAC, that's the mark for the customs union in Russia. So as long as you applied and uh, get all those marks, you, uh, all the requirements, you can put that mark on your product. But they have a hygienic certification, and this covers uh, for our, our, our discussion, we're talking about uh, electronic equipment, uh, things like SAR testing. So there's many products uh, that fall with there. Most of them are food, things that uh, children work with, but for our purposes, we're looking at electronic devices. So you think of it's x-rays, so you can think of it as like the SAR uh, requirements. We're making sure there's not too much uh, uh, of a signal coming out that could cause damage to uh, human cells, and uh, especially for portable devices like cell phones that are held up next to the head or a laptop that's laid on the lap. And so that's what that's concerned with. And um, there's agency that issues those, and it's got to be tested at these agencies. Good to have a... Uh, 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 Russian compliance uh, uh, third-party agent that you're working with to get through the structure because it, it can be kind of uh, difficult to navigate for the TRCU. So as I mentioned, we, you know, there's supposed to be a program coming out that's going to cover the wireless and telecom. Um, it was supposed to come out in 2012, still hasn't happened, and so I don't know when it's going to happen, but uh, at some point uh, we're hoping to see that, and then there truly will be one approval and you get to all five countries. The uh, Savad's uh, uh, certification for all telecom equipment, wired and wireless. Um, so that's your uh, wireless proof you're gonna have to get with Russia, like in the other four countries. You're gonna have to deal with their agencies, such as Armenia. So you see population rank 136, uh, GDP, PPP 137. Uh, they've got a real growth rate showing that they are a growing economy, but this is a very small market. I only included it because it's part of that group of five they have a good English language website and get more information. Belarus is an attractive market country. See population 93rd, GDP PPP 73rd, so proportionally good economy, uh, proportionally higher uh, rates of mobile phones and cell phones. So uh, they've got a, a you know pretty developed infrastructure there, a lot of engineering, a lot of software development going on there. Kazakhstan is uh, uh, a lot of wealth from Petro, so. Uh, as you see, population ranks 63rd, GDP, PPP 43rd. And if you notice uh, one other fact I put here, they were first former Soviet country during an investment grade credit rating back in 2002 from an international bank. And uh, so they've got a good uh, English language website there also. Kyrgyzstan, so sort of like Armenia, uh, their population rank 115th. You see the GDP, uh, PPP is 145th, so proportionally smaller economy. Maybe not as attractive for your country uh, company, but I've included it because it's part of that group of five. So the uh, remaining categories are for these non-EU uh, member countries within uh, the Euro region that accept the CE mark. So you got some that formally accept the CE mark through some type of mutual recognition agreement, and I've included an example Turkey. Others informally accept it, and these are countries that probably would like to join the European Union, but they aren't uh, at a place where they can officially apply yet or officially be accepted as a candidate country, like Serbia, Bosnia, Herzegovina, and then there's independent uh, compliance schemes that are not a part of the European Union, such as the Ukraine. So in Turkey, uh, population ranked 20th in the world, GDP, PPP, 18th in the world, uh, mobile phone and uh, internet usage in line with the population. 
So attractive market country for a lot of companies, and uh, uh, they have an official mutual recognition agreement in place with the EU, and that came from their uh, their EU official member of Canada country since 2005. Uh, they're on path to becoming a member, the full member of the European Union, but they've still got some ways to go, as you notice news lately, politically and economically. They want to make sure that they're going to remain stable before they're accepted in there. As uh, uh, the incident with Greece recently uh, has shown them, they need to be more careful to make sure the countries are uh, stable economically and politically before uh, they become full members of the EU. They have a national telecom authority agency, the uh, ICTA, but as I mentioned, they, they'll accept the CE reports and uh, just need to make sure you're not stamping on any military or uh, frequency spectrum that you're not supposed to be. Bosnia and Herzegovina, as an example, they informally accept CE reports. They don't have a, uh, a formal agreement in place. They're not an official EU Canada country, but they'll accept those as proof of compliance for importation within the country, and the, the CE mark is proof that that product's compliant. So you see that, uh, you know, proportionally the mobile phone use is in line with their population. Internet use is a little bit higher. GDP, PPP is a little bit higher proportionally. So they, they would be an attractive market country. And I expect they'll be on the path to join the EU at some point. They have a national telecom authority, the CRA. As mentioned earlier, this uh, one of our uh, uh, Arabic countries use the same uh, communication regulatory agency, and they have a very good English language website. Then Ukraine, um, so population rank 32nd, GDP PPP is 51st in the world, but as you notice, they've got this ongoing conflict with Russia uh, being inside their borders, uh, while their cell phone and internet uses uh, is, is uh, high, and in case of a high-tech country, uh, they do have some issues there, uh, uh, you know, with political stability. So they have their own compliance scheme, uh, but in most cases they will accept those C reports to prove compliance, but you're still going to have to go through one of these uh, official agents, sort of like a OCD in Brazil, you got to have an official uh, uh, test house, and so this is Euchre test, I'm using example here, and it's under the authority of the State Enterprise, all Ukrainian state research and production center for standardization, metrology, certification, and consumer's rights protection, which I'm pretty sure is the longest name for any agency I've seen. And they've got this uh, acronym, which is also longer than most agency names. But uh, this is one I have uh, experience with, and they cover things like EMC, product safety, wireless telecom testing, energy efficiency, similar to our Energy Star testing. They have a really good English language website, getting a lot of information there on the Ukraine requirements. They do have a National Telecom Authority, Ukrainian State Center for Radio Frequencies, and the English language website with a lot of useful information on spectrum utilization and uh, allocations. So a conclusion to recommendations I'm giving for today, uh, make sure those markets you're going into make sense. If you've got your marketing guys just going crazy because you think it's telling you we're going worldwide, we're going global, well maybe not every country makes sense for your products. Uh, I noticed recently that Nokia is coming back out with their brick phone, if you remember that back from the uh, 1990s, it was one, uh, it, was, uh, it wasn't a smartphone, it was just a simple basic phone. I think the game it had on was snakes, and you could throw it down several flights of stair stairs, and when you have a scratch on it, and keep working fine. Well, that's a product that makes great sense for a country with a less developed infrastructure, where it's going to be outdoors a lot, and in all kinds of temperature and humidity uh, conditions. So maybe for Africa and South America, Central America, that may be a great product to sell, but not so great product to sell in a more developed. Uh, uh, high-tech market like the European Union or, or China or Japan. So make sure that you're looking at, you know, are there enough customers there to support the product going in, to cover all the uh, uh, approval fees uh, for getting there, for the uh, any import, export taxes or regulations are on there. So make sure you're investigating the total cost of what it's going to take to get your products to the market and what a return you can expect on that and what risk you're looking at. Industry affinity groups, uh, a great uh, place to learn about the standards and keep updated. Uh, the Telecommunications Certification uh, Body uh, Council uh, is uh, tcbcouncil.org. Uh, is a really good source. It's an industry government consortium between the FCC and all the TCB labs and TCB stakeholders, such as manufacturers and any interested parties. A uh, good source for all the wireless uh, requirements, not just for the U.S., but they have international people come to and they have uh, workshops twice a year in October and April. 
uh, and also the IEEE uh, societies, such as the EMC Society, Product Safety Engineering Society, very uh, closely affiliated with this uh, requirements, and a, a good place to network to find, uh, start building your own compliance network. And then LinkedIn, I uh, found it to be a very valuable resource for business, especially in international compliance with different groups you can join. I'm mentioning a group called I IoT International Compliance because it happens to be a group that I moderate, but there's a ton of other groups out there. You can just you know, search on uh, regulatory compliance, international compliance, EMC, whatever, and you'll find uh, just uh, dozens of them out there. Uh, find ones that make sense and uh, seem to have accurate information. It's also free industry compliance uh, publications. I'm not... Uh, uh, I mean, I'm subscribed to all uh, three of these. You can get free subscriptions. And compliance is the biggest uh, as far as subscriber base. It covers all aspects of compliance. Interference technology more closely focuses on EMC and EMI topics. Evaluation engineering covers all aspects of test engineering. The uh, magazine usually includes a article or two a month uh, specific to compliance uh, engineering. But building your own knowledgeable experience compliance network is important if you're going to be successful. And that includes agents in these different regions or specific countries and having people you can go to to find out the latest uh, uh, real requirements in those countries and not just rumors. So I'd like to open up for questions at this time. Hi there, Mark. So let's see. You mentioned that Brazil requires in-metro laboratory testing. Are any of these laboratories outside of Brazil? Uh, not currently. They've been a lot of industry push for that to happen, but um, as it stands currently, you've got to get tested within Brazil at an officially uh, designated lab. Uh, if you read their uh, requirements and, and their organization, it it makes uh, it has a system there for where you can do it outside the U.S., but in, in practice, it's never happened that I know of. Okay. Um, okay, this says your slide doesn't, doesn't remember what country it was, but it indicated that an, an importer representative be listed as the applicant. Should an importer representative be used to support the entire test application approval process? Oh, it depends on the country. Uh, uh, this is probably, I mean, some countries just require a local representative that is just contacted in case of a, you know, like there's a, a safety incident uh, with a fire or a harm to a consumer. But in other uh, cases, there will be people that facilitate, if you, uh, for instance, if you get a third party uh, compliance agent, which I would recommend doing for a country like Brazil that has a very complicated uh, uh, process and a uh, unique language of Brazilian Portuguese and uh, things like that. So it's going to depend on the country. There's not uh, one set way of doing things. Uh, I wish there was. I remember when I first got exposed to uh, compliance engineering about 25 years ago, and I was told that, uh, you know, this this was a job that would go obsolete because pretty soon all the countries in the world were going to be following one standard and there would just be one cert and you wouldn't have to do all these different countries. Well, as far as I can see, it's just got more complicated. So it depends country to country. Okay. Um, do you have knowledge of compliance publications issued in other countries? Um, there are. I know the uh, interference technologies, which I mentioned, has the editions that are specific to Europe and uh, editions that are specific to Asia. I'm sure there are uh, other uh, publications. That's a good question. I'm, I'm actually going to reach out to some of my contacts in the EU and uh, in Asia and see if I can find out about those. I know there are in uh, China, there's a couple of different publications, and you can probably see them if you go to the uh, EMC uh, symposium website, because there are always an exhibitor there, and I'm just putting this up here. Uh, for that link, uh, they, this is a good uh, uh, symposium. If you go, just go to one uh, a year. They have uh, all kinds of information there to give them a little plug. But um, there's China. I think it's called EMC and Safety Magazine. So there are other ones out there. I'm just not familiar with all of that. I'll know about China EMC and Product Safety because they translated one of my articles on the EU requirements into Chinese and published it in that magazine. Okay. Um, another question about Brazil. Any MRA agreements to help market entry, for example, a company branch in another region in the world, such as the EU? I'm not quite sure what uh, they're saying. That, uh, can you repeat that? 
Sure. Is there any MRA agreements to help with market entry? Like oh. a company branch in another region in the world, such as the EU, you know, to, to get... No, I'm not aware of anything between Anatol and Metro. There may be some uh, government, you know, economic agreements between at the uh, government level between uh, the European Union and Brazil. And I'm sure there are for, that have to do with trade and uh, import export restrictions or tariffs, but uh, there's uh, not where they can uh, test in Europe and, and have it approved in Brazil. There's not anything in that place. They're very uh, Brazil centric on that. All the you know test lab certification bodies have to be within Brazil. That's what makes uh, Brazil. Uh, so much of a challenge in a lot of cases. Wow, right. So I would, yeah, I would say they probably have to go to the Brazilian uh, ministry, whatever their, their website, and, and get information about things such as that. Sure. Yeah. All right. Um, looks like I got one more question here. And okay, does the ACB website maintain more detailed information about specific countries? Yeah, there's links to uh, uh, previous presentations and things like that, but you can always contact me if you're interested in finding out something more specific. Uh, I'm always wanting to, you know, build my network and contact me on LinkedIn, um, and uh, I'd be glad to uh, uh, make a connection with you there. But uh, I'm always looking for uh, more people that are involved with this to share information with, so uh, I'd be glad to share anything that I can with you. All right, well, great. Uh, I think that looks like all of our questions answered. So before we go really quickly, I'm going to go over some of the upcoming training. Folks can link to us at WLL.com slash US slash Academy. You'll find information on all of our webinars and resident courses available on a variety of engineering, design, and testing topics. So here's our list of upcoming things. Our next product safety webinar covers documents and ongoing requirements. That'll be May 23rd at 11. And then on May 24th, we have the Wireless Technology Webinar Series continuing with wireless immunity. During the first week of June, we have a three-day course on PCB layout and integration for EMC. That'll be instructed by Robert Hansen. Uh, battery technology by Battery University. Due to uh, uh, popular demand, this four-part webinar series is running again. It's going to start in September. And then elsewhere, we have in D.C. the week of August 7th, the IEEE EMC Signal and Power Integrity Symposium. If you plan to attend, we'll have our own Steve Hertz in there. Feel free to stop by and say hello to him. All webinars, resident courses, and webinar recordings are available for purchase from our website. Uh, you can, webinars are available as multi-part series events, so you can choose and join in on detailed discussions on any of the class topics. So sign up for the whole series and receive a 15% discount. And we'd love to hear from you with suggestions on future topics we can present. We also provide customized training at your place or ours. So be sure to visit our Academy training webpage and check out the latest course topics and dates. Mark, uh, looks like we don't have any other questions here. And I guess that's going to conclude today's webinar. At this point, I'll go ahead and end the event. On, right. behalf, on behalf of myself and Washington Lodge Academy, I'd like to thank everyone for their attendance. And enjoy the rest of your day. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye.